Hi guys, it's Debbie and welcome back to my new What I Watched This Month video. This month has been pretty prolific and I have no clue how as I didn't have that much time. But anyway, let's get right to it. Actually, let's cross off of the list one of the most talked about films of the month, Cocaine Bear, which is literally the story of a bear getting high on cocaine, like a whole slab brick of it. Apparently it's a true story, but instead of dropping dead, the bear basically gains nearly supernatural strength and sets off on a violent rampage threatening the locals in its area. My opinion on this film is that it is exactly what it's sold as. An Elizabeth Banks directed film packed with a random selection of actors, also including Ray Liotta, who will forever have this film basically as the last one you see on his list of works, and the crazy ridiculous story of a deranged bear attacking these characters which range from gangsters to rebellious kids to park rangers who all come up with really cheesy lines. You can't watch this film expecting to be a quirky Wes Anderson film. You get exactly what you're promised. At the beginning of the month I also watched Sharper, a new thriller starring Sebastian Stan and Julianne Moore. This film is one plot twist after another. You think you're surprised in one scene and then the film just hits you with a change of path and then another one and then another one. As a matter of fact, I'm going to have to be careful because of spoilers. Let's say Sebastian Stan is um, an ingenious person with a charismatic personality who has a knack for tricking people into believing anything he wishes. And he eventually gets involved in a young woman's life as well as his own mother's and his stepfather's, but not all is what it seems. The problem with this plot is that it only works for half of the film, then it just gets way out of hand. You can only handle so many twists and turns and shocks and people fooling others before it becomes too far-fetched and just ridiculous. But speaking of Julianne Moore, I actually watched another film of hers, a much older film called Safe, which I really, really enjoyed. In this film, she portrays a woman who is stuck in a world of appearances and wealth and brunch with the ladies and a cold relationship at home. Let's just say that the highlight of her day is complaining that the couch is not the right colour. But then she starts to develop a series of odd symptoms, rashes, difficulty breathing, which keep on getting worse and she struggles to figure out what's going on, while this makes her even more isolated from the people close to her. I love this film. It really shows how you can be isolated and misunderstood even when you're completely surrounded by people and live in what is apparently a perfect life. Another film I watched and loved is I'm a Cyborg but that's okay, a beautiful Park Chanuk film about a young woman who is hospitalized in a mental institution because she believes she's a robot. This leads her to having erratic behaviours such as uh, um, talking to electrical appliances but also to carrying out dangerous acts. For example, she refuses to eat except for licking batteries and she even carries out acts which risk her getting killed. So most of the film takes place inside the hospital where we get to know more about her and all the other patients. I'm a big fan of Park Chinook's work although I still have to watch his new film Decision to Leave and I like seeing his hands on different projects from his revenge thriller genre he is mostly known for. Another great film I watched this month, probably my favourite of the whole month, was an Italian film L'ultima notte di amore starring Pier Francesco Favino. Favino is generally considered one of the best Italian actors currently working and this film was excellent. Everybody I know who has watched this film has loved it. It's the story of a police officer who after years of service is reaching the end of his career. He only has to perform his very last days of duty on the police force after 35 years of service. It's been one hell of a ride, he's made some great friends along the way and one in particular is his best friend and colleague Dino. Now when I first read the plot of this film I thought I was going crazy because my father is also a police officer who <laughs> soon after 35 years on the police force is going to retire and his best friend and colleague is called Dino. This is crazy. Anyway, hopefully my dad's last days on the force won't be the same as in the film as on the protagonist's last night ever as a policeman, something really messed up happens. And I'm just going to leave it at that because the rest is a nightmarish roller coaster of one night of craziness while we as viewers are given very little information and have to try to piece everything together. I watched a couple of other Italian films this month but nothing really on that same level. Another good one was Piove. This film is directed by Paolo Stripoli, uh, the director of a classic chorus story, a really great recent Italian horror film which got quite a bit of attention thanks to Netflix and you can tell this guy Paolo Stripoli has a knife for visuals in horror. In Piave, Rome is plagued by something odd in the water which has very scary effects on the population. We see people being physically maimed by it, behaving erratically and violently and things are getting out of hand while nobody can figure out what's going on. The third Italian film I watched was Sole, a much more slow-paced drama about a woman who 
I'm not sure what the correct medical term for this is, an, an illegal surrogate. Basically, she's a pregnant immigrant in Italy who, to make some money, is selling her baby to a couple. During the pregnancy, she stays with one of the men who are organizing this exchange and he pretends to be the father in order to make things a bit more believable with doctor's appointments and so on. But living together, the two get quite close and start to reflect on the situation and the idea of parenthood and selling oneself for money, what people are willing to do for money, the ethics of it all, the detachment from your own body and so on. Then one of the films which surprised me the most this month was Bullet Train, um, a film I had already tried to watch in the past but I had given up on it after the first few minutes because I just wasn't into it. But this time I stuck with it and after a while I was asking myself, am I actually enjoying this? It's the story of different assassins who are on board a high-speed bullet train in Japan and are all tied to one another for different reasons. It's clever, well edited, fun, never boring. I love the Aaron Taylor Johnson and Brian Tyree Henry duo. They were absolutely hilarious, so I'm pleased in the end I actually ended up watching it. But before we go on with the good films, let's take a moment to talk about one of the worst films I watched this month. I finally watched the third Human Centipede movie. The Human Centipede films are based on a torture concept of sewing people one to another, mouth to anus so they form one long digestive system. I don't agree with people who say that the films are bad just because of this concept of it. They're meant to be gory and disgusted, it's just a genre, but a lot more can be said about the way that idea is put on screen. The first film isn't too bad. A crazy doctor scientist abducts three people and performs this sur surgery on them. The second one is based on the idea that a crazy guy sees the first movie and is inspired to do it on more people and it's way more gory. The third one instead goes absolutely insane and they do it on a whole prison. The problem of this third film is that it has some of the worst acting I've ever seen in years. The dialogues I'm embarrassing. None of it makes sense because there is no prison staff or nobody checks on what's going on in that prison. It's just one crazy warden and I think the other guy is accountable to something. Anyway, just no. Speaking of gore, I watched Catch a Kill release, one of those uh, low budget cult uh, horror movies you can find for free on different platforms, even on YouTube. And I can definitely see why this film got so much interest regardless of its low budget. It's basically the story of a couple who get this twisted idea of just killing somebody and they film the whole process, they discuss who would they like as a victim, which categories they would avoid or prefer, they film themselves shopping for weapons and discussing the effect of this and then they move on to actually getting somebody. I was shocked watching this movie, first of all because I think the actors improvised a lot of the lines and second how violent it was on such a low budget. Next up is Tom Hanks's new film A Man Called Otto which wasn't as bad as I expected it to be. Or to better say, it's not what it's advertised as. This film is sold as a funny comedy about a grumpy Tom Hanks who hates his neighbours and gets stuck in hilarious situations with them. In reality, it's actually pretty dark and depressing and I can see why that side of this film wasn't really shown. I then watched two John Berntel films, one good one and one bad one. The bad one was Sharp Stick, um, directed by Lena Dunham. Now, I personally don't like Lena Dunham. I've never really liked her, but but I guess uh, we're here to talk about the film and not her. So Sharpstick is a story of a young woman who is very inexperienced in life. She is very naive, but she ends up having an affair with John Berntel's character, a much older married man. Now, on the one hand, this film is great at depicting sexual tension. Uh, there is in particular one laundry room scene which is perfectly executed in that sense, but the rest of the film is an absolute bin fire. And it's supposed to be a comedy, but where is the comedy? All the rest of the plot makes no sense. All the other interactions of force. The way the story progresses is so unrealistic and also I get the protagonist is naive but some of the things she says are just unlikely and most reactions to this movie were what was the point of it? So let's switch to the good John Berntel film, Small Engine Repair. This film is a completely different genre and is based on a very simple premise. Three friends who have drifted apart due to different reasons are getting together one day. They discuss about their life, their issues, what led them to that point, all while we know something's going to happen. There is something in the air and I won't tell you what it is. Aha. But no, seriously, go and watch this film. Uh, it's really worth it. It's got great dialogues, a lot of dark humour and great character chemistry. By the way, earlier I was mentioning how Sharp Stick was a film that had no point, but I think this month I watched a film that has even less of a point. Lemon, a film which I don't know feels more like a series of short films pasted together about this actor's life which is going to pieces, his failed auditions, his awkward interactions with the other characters, but nothing really had cohesion. It honestly felt like flipping channels on the TV and just seeing bits of different shows, which is a pity because I had super high expectations for this. I then watched the much talked about 
skin and This film is very bizarre. It split audiences and there's this general buzz idea that if you didn't like the film, you have a terrible taste in horror movies. I don't know. I didn't like the film. <laughs> it's the story of some children who in the middle of the night can't find their parents and sort of wander around the house where odd events happen. Odd events meaning there are lengthy sequences of silence, cameras pointing at nothing and you can't see what's going on because there's an insane amount of grain while the kids mumble. To be fair, this film does a great job at recreating that feeling you have with a child of waking up in the middle of the night and not really understand what's going on and your imagination takes over and you see things that aren't really there and the, the noise of the fridge in the other room suddenly becomes the noise of a monster. So I think this film works great with those who tend to be afraid of the dark, have childhood memories of being scared of the dark, of silence, that kind of stuff which would trigger them, but doesn't work at all with those who aren't scared of that. So you might watch it and th find it one of the most frightening things ever or not. March was also Oscar month so I caught up with some nominated titles, for example I watched Living for which Bill Nye was nominated as Best Actor. It's the story of a terminally ill man who's trying to enjoy his last days and ends up befriending and confiding in a much younger colleague of his who also has different perspectives and they end up discussing different matters. This film isn't terrible but after watching all the nominees I can tell Bill Nye didn't really have a chance here. Another Oscar nominee, actually then an Oscar winner, was Guillermo Doros Pinocchio which won for Best Actor animated movie. Um, in my Oscars video I was saying how I find it hilarious that in the same year we had one of the worst Pinocchio movies ever made and one of the best Pinocchio movies ever made. This stop motion movie made me cry, it made me laugh, it was beautifully created and it really managed to convey the feelings of love and grief Geppetto went through. The magical fairy entities were breathtakingly beautiful loved it. I also started to watch some of the uh, short films nominated at the Oscars as I hadn't seen any of them. I watched um, An Ostrich Told Me The World Is Fake and I Think I Believe It, which is the story of a man realising he is just a puppet within an animated world, he is part of a stop motion set which is funny but also kind of gives you existential dread. I also watched The Flying Sailor which is a true story, yes but how <laughs> absurd it sounds. Uh, it's the true story of a sailor who is ejected, literally thrown in the air after an accident between two ships and he flies through the air losing his clothes on the way. This guy was literally found in real life two kilometers away completely fine except for the fact that he was naked. I also watched the Oscar nominated documentary Stranger at the Gate which is wild. It's the true story of a racist man who was so racist that he openly said he planned to carry out an attack at a mosque and murder something like a hundred people but then one day he went there and met the people and found out they're okay and changed his mind. What? <laughs> and the last short film I watched then actually won uh, for best live action short, An Irish Goodbye, the touching story of two brothers dealing with the aftermath of their mother's death. I was talking about this topic last month of how people deal with grief in different ways and sometimes it's laying in bed crying all day and other times it's doing crazy things and I love to see realistic reactions and depictions of that. I actually also re-watched another Oscar nominated film I'd already watched in December, Steven Spielberg's beautiful um, rendition of his love for cinema and his uh, family in The Fablemans. I thought that re-watching this film would have been very boring because it is quite lengthy but instead it went very smoothly and I actually enjoyed watching the actors with the knowledge of what they're thinking and doing and where they'll end up. It's a pity that it didn't win absolutely anything at the Oscars. I then watched a film which is probably the furthest thing you could ever imagine for an Oscar waiting. Uh, one of Ryan Reynolds' less known comedies and rightfully so. So, this film revolves around the staff at a restaurant, their relationships, friendships, rivalries, funny skits. I think this film follows the same concept of Cocaine Bear. You get exactly what this film offers. A super silly, unnecessarily sexualized with really badly written dialogues and the kind of plot you would enjoy at 14. Now fun fact, in March I actually watched another comedy film I thought would have followed along those same lines but which actually surprised me. Um, the Long Shot starring uh, uh, Seth Rogen and Charlize Theron as a two childhood friends who meet years later but when she is basically secretary of state one of the most important women in America and he instead hasn't done much since and for a series of reasons they end up working together and something sparks between them. It's still packed with a lot of brainless humour but it isn't as bad as I was expecting it to be. I then watched Irma Vep which has been on my watch list for 
years. They also recently made a series based on this film starring Alicia Vikander, but this is the original 90s French film. It stars Maggie Chung as a fictionalized version of herself as a foreign actress in France trying to make it through the disastrous production of a film. Nothing seems to go right, then the friendships and relationships with the cast and crew start to get out of hand. Anyway, I really like this film and I wonder if Maggie Chung really had to go through some of these experiences in real life as an actress. And by the way, she actually then married the director of the film. So now it feels like a film within a film within life. In March, I also finally watched uh, The Gladiator, a film of which I had seen bits over the years, but I never sat down and watched the whole thing. But I had to watch it, especially given the fact that next year, November 2024, there will be Gladiator 2, starring Denzel Washington, Barry Keoghan, Nepal Miskal. Anyway, as I expected, I really like this film. I can see why some criticised its darkness, but that's one of the things I loved most about it. It's the story of a Roman general, Russell Crowe, who's unfairly sent into slavery by a psychopathic emperor, Joaquin Phoenix. Phoenix was absolutely amazing in this role, and in hindsight, you can tell how this was the role that made the whole world fall in love with his acting. I then watched Boiling Point, a one-shot film, so filmed in one long continuous take, all set inside a high-end London restaurant. The characters are all cooks and waiters and staff who are under pressure to serve all these rich, spoiled customers, while also dealing with being understaffed, with internal issues that they're facing, until they reach Boiling Point. I think the one-shot idea worked really well here, it really enhances the feeling of never-ending pressure put on the staff throughout the evening. In March, I also watched the elementary school, a 90s Czechoslovak film about a boy, his schoolmates, uh, his family, right after the end of World War II. This film doesn't have action-packed sequences, gripping twists and turns, but I found myself smiling while looking at this other corner of the world, another life story, but still with all those recognisable child behaviours which are the same all around the world in any time period. I then tried out a new Netflix documentary everybody was talking about, MH370, The Plane That Disappeared, about that famous Malaysia Airlines uh, plane that completely disappeared just a few years ago. I think creepy Netflix documentaries are a hit or miss. Some like Don't Fuck With Cats, American Murder, The Disappearance of Magnin McCann, The Keepers, The Trials of Gabriel Fernandez are very well put together. But then some like the Cecil Hotel documentary and this MH371 just end up showing the one of the investigators who wanted to solve the case and that's it. This documentary felt more like a Shane Dawson video with a compilation of conspiracy theories about the fly. I then watched Kira Knightley's new thriller film, uh, Boston Strangler. Now, probably my favourite genre of films are crime thrillers, and having seen so many of them, I'm probably spoiled at this point, and I expected this to be something on the lines of Seven and Prisoners. Spoiler, it isn't. It's the story of a killer who in the 60s murdered 13 women and the, of the reporter who broke the news of this happening. I guess it isn't that bad, it just wasn't this super gripping scary crime thriller. It's more about the issues that arise in journalism, about reported scary facts, the responsibility, the implications, that side of things. I then watched I actually think I might have seen this already in the past, uh, Dead Don't Die in Dallas, a really cheap B comedy horror movie about a group of super religious people and some members of the LGBT community who have to try to survive together in a zombie apocalypse. That's all I have to say about this film. Next up we have Jerry and Marge Go Large, the true story of a couple who figured out a loophole in the lottery by which, um, if my understanding of the math is correct, uh, when they bought a very high amount of tickets they just were basically statistically guaranteed to win something. This film was interesting mostly because it was a true story but I don't know if I'd actively choose to sit down and re-watch this all again. I then crossed off my watch list, a film I'd been meaning to watch for years, Chapter 27, starring Jared Leto and Lindsay Lohan. This is the film of those photos of fat Jared Leto with a famous movie fact about him eating ice cream and olive oil to prepare for the role of Mark Chapman, the man who shot and killed John Lennon. I mean, I guess Jared Leto wasn't too terrible in this role, but it's nowhere even close to most of his other performances. Lindsay Lohan was Lindsay Lohan, I wasn't expecting her to Meryl Streep this. But last but not least, on today's list is a short film I kept for last because of how peculiar it is. Uh, Strawberry Shortcut. I found it on my watch list, I have no idea when or why I added it. It's a one minute 90 short film which has some incredibly high ratings and I think it's one of those cult short movies you just have to watch. It's a sort of spoof on cooking shows and it was directed by Tom Rubinitz who was an AIDS activist and it was dedicated to the hope of a cure for HIV and AIDS, of which he unfortunately then died shortly afterwards. He also directed another short film, Pickle Surprise, 
maybe I'll watch it in April. But for now, we have reached the end of today's list. Of course, I would love to hear what you've been watching this month, what you loved watching, what you didn't like, what you think about all the titles I spoke about today. Let me know everything with a comment down below. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, make sure to subscribe and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.